Again, the goal of this webinar is to encourage reporting, sharing, learning of medication incidents and medication safety topics to bridge the silos in healthcare and optimize med safety in all care settings. And as a reminder, we need as much feedback from you as possible. And we've developed a number of new questions for the post-webinar survey. Um, we'll be rotating the questions so you don't have to answer each one after, uh, the same ones after each webinar. So please ensure that you read the question every time because they're likely different um, than the previous episode. You'll have multiple opportunities to respond to the webinar questions, including the poll at the end of the live webinar that's shown on the right panel and as pop-up web pages after you close the webinar window, as well as in the attachments in the thank you for attending email about a week later. And now for today's overview. The webinar, um, we're gonna hear about a hospital's analysis of preventable adverse drug events, and we'll see some of the technical documents that came out of the WHO's third uh, global patient safety challenge called Medication Without Harm. And this will be followed by the observatory with updates from Health Canada on a recent safety concern, or actually a long-standing safety concern, and from uh, Canadian Patient Safety Institute on some of the current projects. And at the end, we'll have a discussion period where we can uh, do a question and answer session with some of your questions you've submitted. And uh, as usual, as always, we respect the anonymity of those who wish to remain anonymous. And so we'll only introduce speakers briefly and they can choose to share as much or as little as they'd like about themselves and their practice site. And now I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker who will describe um, a uh, wide ranging hospital wide analysis of adverse drug events and the subsequent development of educational tools to prevent recurrence. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to start by explaining how our preventable adverse drug event program evolved. Initial uh, a research study that we conducted back in 2016 was based on the finding in the medical literature that 10% of medical admissions are due to a preventable adverse drug event. And our thinking was that if we understood the root causes of these preventable adverse drug events, we could develop strategies to prevent or mitigate them. So that has been the key concept that has been driving all the subsequent work. The objectives of our initial study was first to identify root causes of preventable adverse drug events contributing to admission, and we did that for 120 patients. We then developed learning messages for patients and families and healthcare providers based on the root causes and learning that we found. And third, we developed an electronic tool to allow us to routinely capture on an ongoing basis the preventable adverse drug event found on admission, the root cause associated with it, actions taken in hospital to prevent recurrence, and then we share this information with the relevant care providers in the community by um, having a PDF letter as output from that research, from that uh, electronic tool. We can go to that next slide. These are the learning messages that we produced. Uh, there's 10 of them, six for healthcare providers and four for patients and families. Uh, they can be found on these websites. The patient and family leaflets are available at the moment in traditional Chinese, and we will be producing simple Chinese versions of them as well. So for today, I'm going to talk about just two of these messages, uh, sick day medication management and medication mix-ups. By that, we mean harm that has occurred from the patient taking or not taking medications, but specifically with regard to patients not enacting intended changes from a previous medical encounter, usually because the patient hadn't understood that the medication had changed. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Mike. Sick day medication management is going to be the focus of the of first discussion. This is referring to a strategy that's aimed to avoid drug-related harm. That's a consequence of taking a medication from a group of drugs known by the mnemonic SADMANS, specifically during periods of reduced fluid intake that's usually existing with a, a concurrent illness. 
The typical side effects that these medications would cause if taken during reduced fluid intake would be hypotension, acute kidney injury, hypoglycemia, and lactic acidosis from metformin. So this um, strategy has been advocated since 2013 by the Canadian Diabetes Association and typically is a strategy that various international organizations um, involved with diabetes or nephrology do advocate. Based from our learning from our study, we did add to, add to this strategy specific direction on how patients can avoid bleeding or high INRs related to warfarin and specifically created a section for sulfonylureas related to reduced caloric intake, which you'll, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, the purpose behind our efforts to address sick day man medication management was because 15% of our admissions were actually attributed to absence of such a plan. And with regard to patients who had preventable adverse drug events, related to hypotension, half of them were attributed to absence of such a plan. Oh, we can go to that next slide. These are the two patient leaflets um, developed. Actually, the, the one on the left is a patient leaflet, and the one on the right is a companion leaflet for healthcare providers to help the healthcare provider appropriately fill the patient version in for them. Um, as you can see, there's three colored sections. The green is around medications to be held just, just for the period of reduced fluid intake. So that is specifically the sad man's group. Again, it's a mnemonic that has been um, in the literature for several years. It's not, not at all our invention. The lilac section is a, a section on how to uh, know when not to take sulfonylureas during periods of reduced caloric intake. And the pink section is directing the patient if they're taking warfarin and they either have reduced caloric intake or very bad diarrhea or a combination of both, just to skip warfarin for a day and get a requisition for an INR in three to four days' time. We can go to the next slide, Mike. Very, uh, very important uh, learning that we, we found from our study was that a very common root cause was patients and families had not understood information that had been given by a previous provider. So woven through all of our learning messages is an emphasis on encouraging healthcare providers to confirm that the patient and their family have understood the advice or instructions given. So on the reverse of our patient of our sorry our provider leaflet for a sick day medication management, we have a suggested dialogue to help the provider confirm patient and family understanding, and that, and that, as I mentioned, is woven through all of our messages. We can go to the next slide. Um, the third objective of our study was to create the electronic tool that would act as a surveillance tool, but also um, help us communicate our findings to healthcare providers in the moment so that we could provide continuity of care and information about actions taken in hospital. So this is the output from our electronic tool, which is a letter aimed to the family doctor and community pharmacist. So in this particular example, we're saying that the patient had presented to hospital with hypotension and acute kidney injury. The patient um, continued taking empagliflozin and ramipril despite reduced fluid intake. And so we're going to give them a sick day medication plan. We're going to confirm patient or family understanding and we're asking the community pharmacist to follow up by continuing to, to confirm ability to follow the sick day plan at future dispensing of effective medications. And all of our, our learning has been uh, used to generate uh, drop down menus in this electronic tool, so these letters are, are quite easy to generate. We can go to the next slide. The second uh, example of the learning message I wanted to discuss today is around medication mix-ups. And this is just an extract from the one-pager learning message. And again, it's, it's um, addressing the using the teach-back process to verify understanding of information provided. So in, in this context, this is related to a patient who is being discharged from hospital. And we're encouraging the, the hospital physician and team to confirm that the patient and family know what to do when they leave. So specifically to listen to see if they can c 
correctly state that they are going to go and pick up that new prescription or take the new prescription to pharmacy, and that they can correctly anticipate how they're going to manage the medication that has been stopped during that admission, but they have an existing supply at home. We had several patients come in with serious adverse drug events because they had continued to take a medication that was intended to be stopped, but um, they had an existing supply. Um, and we also feel that if the patient and family understand the reason for the medication change, that they might be more likely to enact the plan. So uh, this is what this, this message is addressing. And similarly, it, um, we had preventable adverse drug events related to patients um, not um, addressing change medication doses, um, et cetera, not even uh, picking up new prescriptions. We can go to the next slide, I think. The impact on the care process for healthcare providers at our, at our hospital is that we're encouraging all providers to think about the presence of a preventable adverse drug event on admission. And, and so this does require looking, looking through perhaps a slightly different lens. Uh, for example, a patient who presents with an upper GI bleed due to an anticoagulant, on the surface, at first glance, it might appear that it's an adverse drug reaction to that medication. But on further digging and careful inquiry, if we, if we identify that the patient, in fact, has had symptoms of bleeding for several days or a week or, even, or longer, um, and they hadn't recognized the importance of that bleeding, and, and symptoms, um, we would attribute this to actually a preventable adverse drug event because the patient hadn't understood their red flag symptoms that would require medical attention. And we would address that for them in the hospital and then again share that with the community provider, like the community pharmacist and the family doctor so that they are uh, hopefully made more aware of the consequences of, of not confirming this ability to, not to notice red flag symptoms. We can go to the next slide. This is a slide that summarizes the common types of presentation that were due to preventable adverse drug events and the associated root causes. So as you can see, COPD and asthma, bleeding, hypertension, heart failure was a, was a top four. Um, and our learning messages probably address about 80% of, of the common preventable adverse drug events that we found and, the, and their associated root causes. Um, one example for bleeding, would, on, and it's included on a bleeding message, is that uh, community providers are not necessarily asking screening questions about use of NSAIDs when the patient's on an, anti, on an anticoagulant. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Common root causes are summarized here, and this is, this is uh, because several patients would have two or three root causes. So again, you can see that patients not understanding information is a very common root cause, unable to identify medication side effect, and intentional non-adherence, all very, very common among our study population. We can go to the next slide, thanks. A more difficult root cause is the culture um, in the hospital. Um, so this, this is perhaps illustrated by the difference between these two questions that reflect a different mindset. So we, we do feel that in our hospital, we do take over the care of the patient, and we don't use a period of hospitalization to confirm that the patients can carry out their, their tasks that would actually help them stay out of hospital because they don't understand the purpose behind the task. So we hope to move towards uh, a mindset that's more in line with a second, second approach. And then last slide. Now, in summary, we feel that preventable adverse drug events can be prevented if we identify them, take actions to address the root cause, share those actions with providers to increase awareness, and confirm patient and family understanding of actions taken to prevent recurrence. Um, so that ends my presentation. Um, thank you uh, so much for uh, sharing all this analysis with us and, and all the work that you've done. And even more so, I know that your resources uh, that the team has developed uh, um, will be uh, posted along with the recording of our, of, uh, on our YouTube site or on our webpage afterwards so that all of you in the audience can, can peruse some of these resources. Um, these are the key learning points that we've identified uh, from this, and, and although there's a great number of them, 
Um, and one of the things you highlighted earlier is that we're encouraged to think about the presence of a potential and preventable adverse drug event uh, on the admission of a patient or on presentation of the patient to medical care. And you've outlined a number of the common root causes of uh, preventable adverse drug events, and a lot of them go towards a lack of patient understanding. And so your med safety exercise includes such things as um, what do you know about the adverse drug events in your own practice or people who visit your own care facility? And how many of these events might be preventable? And after you've looked at some of the resources that we're going to link to, how do you ensure that patients and caregivers understand the nature of any therapeutic changes and can you use some of those resources in your own practice? So for our second segment, I'd like to take some time today to talk about three very useful documents released by the World Health Organization in the summer of 2019. Some of you are going to be familiar with them and some of you may already have used them, but I thought I'd highlight them here on MedSafety Exchange to give them some greater exposure, um, give you all some insight into the documents and the creation of the documents, and give some thoughts maybe on how you can use them uh, as more than just um, sort of compendium of ideas. Um, links to these freely available documents will be available on our webpage um, when we post the recording, and these are also discoverable at any time at the WHO website. I'll talk a bit of, about each one in turn, but I'm going to start off by explaining a bit about the history and the context of these documents. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the World Health Organization's third global patient safety challenge and entitled Medication Without Harm. And this is a global initiative that aims to reduce the level of severe avoidable harm related to medications by 50% over the next five years. The strategic framework of the Global Patient Safety Challenge depicts the four domains of the challenge, which are patients in the public, healthcare professionals, medicines, and systems and practices of medication. And each of these domains is further subdivided into four domains. And in the middle, in that sort of white circle, you'll see uh, what are described as the three key action areas, which are transitions of care, polypharmacy, and high-risk uh, slash high-alert situations. I think in the development of the program, it was recognized that we needed a good common understanding around the world, as well as some go-to resources for these action areas, so that you know each of these action areas could have an outline of their own context, what sort of harm um, is caused by them, some of the challenges uh, that we face in dealing with transitions of care, polypharmacy, and high-risk uh, situations, and an outline of some of the potential strategies that could be effective in accomplishing the goal of, um, of uh, reducing harm by 50%. And furthermore, these documents had to be relevant in the global variety of care settings in low, middle, and high-income countries. The strategies needed to be tailorable to political and social variations and really all the various forms of technology or lack of technology and in really all the ways in which we deliver healthcare around the world. The first draft of these documents was completed way back in August of 2016 and the fact that these reports took three years to release, I think, gives some evidence to how much work went into them. Um, efforts in editing, refining, review, and validation, and checking, and double-checking, and, and I really appreciate the work of the lead authors in pulling, of all, all, pulling all this together. But I think the reasons behind the time spent are, are twofold. Uh, firstly, the WHO is a global concern, and it has a mandate and interest in the health of all nations and peoples, and the stories and the analysis and the interventions and the evidence and the document, they needed to be practical, they needed to instigate long-lasting behavior change, but they also needed to be possible and meaningful in, again, the wide variety of delivery models and resource levels that we have in healthcare around the world. And great care, I think, was taken to incorporate development and review from a wide variety of care settings and income levels and disciplines. And secondly, a document endorsed and distributed by the WHO carries great authority and credibility 
particularly in areas without other organizations or other regulatory bodies or, or other degrees of oversight. So a document like these needs multiple layers of review. And I'm also pleased to tell you the significant Canadian content in these documents. Um, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, Patients for Patient Safety Canada, ISMP Canada, as well as other Canadian interests and researchers contributed to both the development of the program itself as well as having extensive input into these documents. And the work done in Canada by all of us in healthcare is really a source of a lot of the evidence and a lot of the initiatives presented in these documents. And it's, I think it's a reflection of the credibility and authority that, that all of our work carries. And the documents are all organized somewhat similarly. There's an introduction and an exploration of context and background and rationale for why this is a problem. And what I refer to in the, as the knowledge base in each document is a larger section dedicated to reviewing the evidence and reviewing the literature, describing various approaches, reviewing underlying contributors to the issue, and uh, associate considerations of you know, deciding what to do, of uh, assisting in implementation and evaluation and measurement. And I think particularly helpful are some of the examples and case studies of what's been done, how well it worked, um, and in a lot of cases, an examination of what you need to think about as you implement these strategies and how to do it well. And each document has concluding sections about what further work needs to be done. And this includes things that I think we could all agree on, like local prioritization, um, creating local intelligence, um, things we do in healthcare, like implementation, evaluation, and sharing of experiences. We all acknowledge the safety vulnerability that is a transition in care. This, and despite years of work, problems of transition of care continue to occur, and, and this is true throughout the world. And in this document, there's lots of evidence from Iran, Colombia, England, Sweden, and, and really it all confirms that the majority of patients admitted to hospital experience one or more medication discrepancies. And the number from community and long-term care may not be any better. The Medication Safety and Transitions of Care technical document covers a number of these issues, but I think the section about what has been done to try and improve safety is particularly useful. And this section covers um, engagement with patients, families, and caregivers, the types of information and quality about the information that you receive or that helps guide transitions of care, and some interventions related to both discharge and post-discharge that may be helpful. The document also contains a larger section um, outlining a lot of the toolkits and resources available in MedRec and Transitions of Care, available in other countries and other jurisdictions. And I think that's really worth reviewing when you are planning interventions or when you're reviewing your own procedures and processes. I think it's really important to highlight, too, that the document does not shy away from examining the challenges that exist with transitions of care, and this includes information quality, the interoperability of uh, systems, of databases, things like patient compliance and concordance, and higher level things like the commitment of leadership, and the things that we don't do maybe so well when we implement projects, such as measurement and, and evaluation. And also acknowledges the complexity of healthcare delivery, including the variable health literacy of patients and caregivers, competing priorities that healthcare workers need to balance. The technical document, Medication Safety in High-Risk Situations, addresses the circumstances which are associated with a significant risk of medication-related harm. And one of the things you learn early on when you work internationally is that many jurisdictions prefer the term high-risk medications, where in North America we tend to prefer the term high-alert medications. In any case, this reference document takes a sort of a broad definition of high risk, high alert concepts, and that includes the inherent risks of certain medications, like those with a small therapeutic index, um, uh, an examination of unsafe medication use processes, a review of some of the clinical scenarios that make safe medication practices very difficult, such as uh, during transport or during uh, urgent and emergent uh, scenarios. It also examines drug reactions and, of course, medication errors. 
And in the document is a, is a list of high-risk medications, and you'll recognize a number of our own high-alert medications, but you'll also see maybe medications like antibiotics that are not necessarily those we would find on all high-alert drug lists, but those that may bear a consideration for additional safeguards. And the review of interventions to reduce harm from high alert medications and high risk uh, situations presents both higher level general strategies that may be applicable to a broad set of medications, but also a lot of many drug specific strategies that I think are, are worth looking at. The Medication Safety and Polypharmacy Technical Document uh, integrates and consolidates what we've learned in really the rather short history of tackling polypharmacy, and I think it's a really good foundation to build on. Importantly, the approach is not necessarily one of simply numbers, uh, such as is polypharmacy more than five medications or seven or nine. Rather, the focus is on appropriateness. And I think like most things in healthcare, the identification of absolutes is problematic. In certain cases, in certain individuals, 12 medications may in fact be entirely appropriate and rational. In other cases, four drugs may be too many and may be causing harm. And the balancing between the number of pills and the appropriateness of therapy and the minimization of harm and maximization of benefit it is a difficult one to achieve. But the authors of the document do provide a fair amount of helpful guidance in striving for this. And you'll note the first item in this approach is what matters to the patient. And I think we'd all agree that patient-centered approach is absolutely necessary to reducing the harms from polypharmacy without uh, compromising any of the potential benefit that these medications provide. As you use these documents, I think as a reference documents, I think they are really good for that. They're very practical, they're well written and, and uh, clear, and they have lots of references and uh, lots of resources in them. And they're also useful to us as practitioners if we're trying to determine what initiatives we want to implement in medication safety. It's a great resource of ideas and projects that you'll probably want to review in order to strengthen the work you're doing and to learn from others who have done similar work. I also think they're an excellent introduction to the topics of high alert medications, transitions in care, and polypharmacy for new clinicians or for clinicians who are newly interested in medication safety or, or patient uh, safety. They're really great resources for, for new graduates or those newly interested. Importantly, I think the document is designed to be accessible to non-clinical personnel. I think the WHO and the authors themselves recognize, recognize that to implement uh, much of this work requires changes in prioritization, changes in legislation, and, and really the commitment of administrators and politicians and governments, and we often need to convince non-clinicians of the need for this work, and that includes giving these people a bit of a grounding in medication safety to understand what really the problems are, what the vulnerabilities are, what the harm is, and, and what approaches we can use to help. So when you're trying to convince your own administrators or your board about the value of your medication safety initiatives, I think these documents would be excellent references to instruct and convince your leadership. I think the third point here might be underappreciated in Canada. I mean, we're lucky in Canada to have a relatively mature healthcare system and we have local, regional, and national oversight, and in some cases, multiple oversights over practices, products, devices, and care. And we have a strong regulatory bodies that guide healthcare so we may not always pay attention to other international jurisdictions that don't have similar structures. And I don't think we fully understand the role or the need for a global organizations such as WHO and its formal collaborating organizations such as the CPSI. And I don't think we appreciate the authority and credibility that such groups carry. And I, I do wish to stress that the WHO has a very strong standing in the global context as an organization dedicated to health and patient safety, and we really shouldn't hesitate to leverage that standing and that credibility in some of the more local work that we do. And as you read through these, I think you'll recognize a lot of the material. There is a lot of Canadian content in there, and you may even think that, you know, we're doing this stuff already, the stuff that we've been doing for years, really. 
And I think you'll also realize, though, that despite the work we've already put in, there's still a long way to go. And the fact that there is recognizable uh, approaches in there and strategies, there is a lot of Canadian content, which is, you know, your content and your work in these documents. It's really not a license to stand still, and we know there's so much work to do. Patients are still harmed by medicines, and we need to prevent that. So ideally, we'll learn from that, and we'll take these technical documents, and we'll review them, and we'll update them periodically. So the work that we do now based on that will inform f further editions of this, and we'll strengthen our knowledge base and strengthen our evidence as to what works. So I encourage you to review these documents, um, bookmark them, download them however you want to do that, and have them handy as resources and use them to further your own local work in medication safety, and importantly, share uh, what you've learned from them. So the key learning points uh, from, uh, from the session here are, there are three technical documents ad addressing three, I think, critical areas in medication safety, transitions in care, high-risk situations, and polypharmacy. And, and ideally, these are going to be used as very practical and accessible re references for, for work in medication safety. And in terms of medication safety exercise, I'm going to give you some assigned reading, um, is to review each of these three technical documents, and ideally relatively in-depth, but at least have an understanding of what's in them. And choose a process that you're already working on, perhaps, or some process in your organization that touches on any of these domains, and look at the technical document that's uh, related to that, and use that to strengthen your practices develop an improvement initiative, or um, just ensure that you're sort of using uh, best approaches that we have these days. So now we'll uh, move on to the observatory uh, for some medication safety updates. And our first update is uh, from Health Canada. Tacrolimus is an immunosuppressant used to prevent or treat organ transplant rejection. So tacrolimus has a narrow therapeutic index and there is variability in pharmacokinetics between patients. As a result, doses must be individualized and blood concentration monitoring is required to ensure that drug levels are in the therapeutic range. Until recently, two distinct oral formulations with different dose requirements were available in Canada. Prograph was first marketed in 1996, followed later by the long-acting formulation Advograph in 2008, which has the advantage of once daily dosing. Next slide, please. There are a number of shared characteristics between these two products. Both are capsules. They are available in the same strengths. The brand names are similar and are not differentiated by a modifier, such as XR, for example, to identify the long-acting product. At the time of market approval, the labeling and packaging were also similar, and of course, they share the same indication. Next slide, too much. Some of these errors describe serious consequences, such as transplant rejections. In 2009, Health Canada received a case report of a similar mix-up in a Canadian post-transplant patient. ISMP Canada also issued an alert around the same time based on error reports. Next slide. Health Canada worked with the manufacturer of Prograph and Advograph to implement product naming, labeling, and packaging strategies to better differentiate the product formulations. For Prograph, we added immediate release to the non-proprietary name wherever it appeared on the labels and in the product monograph so that it reads Tacrolimus Immediate Release Capsules. We also added dosage instructions for transplant patients to take the product every 12 hours to the labels. In the product monograph, we drafted text for both health professionals and consumers to alert them to the risk of inadvertent substitution and moving forward, generic products have also been instructed to adopt these same strategies. And next slide, please. 
Similar changes were made to Advograph, adding extended release next to the non-proprietary name throughout all labeling. The sponsor also changed the packaging of the product so that it looked more distinct. Advograph was changed to a blister pack in a carton, while Prograph remained in a bottle. Once daily was added prominently in red uppercase text to the carton, as you see here on the upper right-hand side of the label, and also to the blisters containing the capsules. Again, the health professional and consumer information sections of the product monograph were updated to alert patients and health professionals to the risk of error. We have developed naming strategies for the generic versions of Advograph so that when they are marketed, they will be clearly identified as long-acting products. Next slide, please. In 2019, Health Canada approved a third formulation of tacrolimus. This new product is called Envarsis PA and is a once daily long acting product. It uses a new technology which increases the absorption of compounds such as tacrolimus that are poorly water soluble. As a result of the increased absorption, the dose of Envarsis PA is lower compared to Prograph or Advograph. During our review of the product, we identified that the availability of a third formulation increases the risk of substitution errors between the different tacrolimus formulations. There are again shared characteristics between this new product and the previous ones, such as the once daily dosing, the one milligram strength, and the oral route. And with dosing being highly individualized, the dose itself is not necessarily an indicator of which product should be dispensed. Next slide, please. Again, we work with the manufacturer on naming and labeling strategies to prevent errors. The modifier PA to represent prolonged action or prolonged release was added to the brand name to replace a proposed modifier that had the potential for confusion with the modifier conditionally approved for the generic extended release products of Advograph. Prolonged release was added instead of extended release to the non-proprietary name wherever it appears on labeling so that it reads as Tacrolimus prolonged release tablets. Unfortunately, there were some restrictions based on international standards and we were limited as to what term we could use here when prolonged action may appear to have been a better fit to correspond with the modifier PA that was chosen. Once daily was added prominently in bold black text to different panels of the label. Warning statements on inadvertent substitution were added to the healthcare professional and consumer information sections of the PM. Next slide, please. In collaboration with the seven manufacturers of approved Tacrolimus products, Health Canada released a risk communication in July 2019 advising healthcare professionals of the risk of substitution errors with the different tacrolimus formulations. This alert was distributed directly by the manufacturers to all pharmacies and hospitals across Canada and to health and medical professional associations. Health Canada further disseminated it through the MedEffect e-notice email notification system, as well as social media channels, including LinkedIn and Twitter. And thank you, that is the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, thanks so much. I apologize for the connection uh, problem that uh, introduced the delay into how we move the slides. Um, now we'll have an update uh, on a joint uh, CPSI, uh, ICMP Canada med safety uh, project. So I'll hand that over to you. So thank you. And uh, this uh, ties in very nicely with your WHO update. Um, and uh, I want to uh, thank Steve Rutledge, who's my uh, CPSI colleague supporting this project. So, so this little uh, quick update on our uh, medication safety self-assessment focus on NEVER events. And um, you'll recall, uh, Mike, if we could have the next slide, I did present the pilot results at the last uh, Med Safety Exchange for those of you that uh, were listening to that one. So just NEVER events are those patient safety incidents that can result in serious harm or death and that can be prevented by using organizational checks and balances. 
And so we now have developed um, two separate documents, uh, assessment programs, one for acute care and one for long-term care. So if you could go to the next slide, Mike. And, um, and we're looking for 100 teams to help us do a national snapshot. And the reasons for participation are to help you locally identify vulnerabilities and safety strategies related to medication use in your setting. And as soon as you enter your results into our online program, you will be able to see how you compare your peer group. And then all of this data will contribute to a national baseline uh, measurement. So the next slide, Mike, please. And so we're very, very excited to see our registration so far. We set a goal of 100 sites altogether, 60 acute care sites and 40 long-term care sites. And despite sending out this notice right before Christmas, we are almost halfway there already. So thanks to all of you who have already registered. And we hope that, uh, that we will meet or even exceed that goal by the end of March. And, and our goal is to get all the data entered by the end of March so that we can then look at the results um, to anyone who's nervous that they might not be able to get their data in in time, um, you certainly can still enter your data and you will be able to see your own results, but you might not be included in our sort of snapshot group. Um, so to let you know as well, the, the assessments are fully available in English and French. Um, there is no charge to participate and we think you should be able to complete the assessment in one meeting. Um, for long-term care, probably about an hour and for acute care, it will probably take you a couple of hours just because there are more questions. And uh, that's it for me and we'll look forward to presenting the results in the spring. Thanks, Mike. Um, thanks so much, Julie. Yeah, it's, it's going to be um, cool to see all those findings from, the, uh, from a national perspective. Um, I want to thank um, all of our speakers for what we learned and what we shared today uh, towards optimizing medication safety. We do have a few more minutes left um, for uh, questions, and uh, what I thought I'd start off with is um, uh, from the uh, Richmond Preventable Adverse Drug uh, Event Study. Um, we'll go through a couple of these questions. Um, so. Um, one question from a respondent is, how did you go about determining what the preventable ADRs were? Um, was it a chart review of some sort or some sort of coding exercises? How did you determine that? Right, yes. Our study was funded, so how we approached this was that we had a research committee review standard chart abstracts that were compiled by a full-time research nurse. And importantly, the research nurse um, did quite detailed interviews with all patients and family members and care providers. And we had physicians and pharmacists interview respectively uh, relevant physicians or pharmacists that were involved in the ADE. So I would call the community pharmacist uh, of the patient. Uh, one of our physician members would call the family doctor, etc. And then um, each potential preventable adverse drug event was assessed independently by always one physician and one pharmacist from our research team that met on a regular basis to review the case studies or ca the cases and uh, then discuss root causes and vote on them. So we had a, had a, a systematic approach to that. And a second question, um, I'll combine two questions. Um, a lot of what you described needs buy-in from community providers. So how do you notify them? How do you ensure that? Um, but I also think there's enormous amount of opportunity at discharge to come up with a plan to prevent the next admission. And we often miss that opportunity in healthcare. You're in the early phases of this project, but what do you see moving forward as key points um, in the hospital environment? Right. Yeah, I think, I think the short answer to how we currently notify community pharmacists is, is that we don't. We, we don't routinely notify community pharmacists at discharge. What we're trying to do with this initiative now, moving forward, is that we will notify them if we identify a patient presents with a preventable adverse drug event. And I guess that is an important piece of what we're saying is an opportunity to prevent recurrence, is that you need to identify it on admission and then set in play the actions that you need to do to prevent that recurrence, which should be initiated straight away. So for example, if a patient is non-adherent to daily weights for heart failure, we found mainly that they didn't understand the purpose and the benefit 
of, of what weighing themselves would do. So we need to address that throughout the hospital stay, not just at discharge. Um, thank you. And I'll have one last question for um, Health Canada. Um, uh, this is from a respondent at West. I think the risk is a uh, risk of drugs like this, like Advergraph and Prograph, is also compounded by the fact that immediate, extended, prolonged have really no real definition and are used arbitrarily. I think we all sort of understand what immediate means, but extended, prolonged, continuous are used irregularly and inconsistently from drug to drug and can have overlapping time frames of activity. Is there some movement or any thought to making these modifiers more systematic and consistent? I would agree that there is a lack of standardization for these terms and there is no specific definition applied, for example, between extended release and prolonged release. Uh, we, in collaboration with ISMP Canada a few years ago, we did undertake a review of certain modifiers that are used on, on various drugs and, um, you know, with the legacy of older products on the market, it, it definitely is a challenging problem to address. Um, moving forward, we do have, as of 2014 actually, we, we have a more rigorous structure in place to identify potential naming issues. So issues like this are something that we are, we are more aware of and uh, where possible we do work with sponsors to try to address them and come up with a, a solution. But again, I would agree that there is a lack of standardization and that's, um, that unfortunately is, is difficult to address considering the number of products already on the market that, that share these terms. Um, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to all uh, for submitting your questions. We don't have time to get to them all today, but we will forward them to the speakers and uh, provide you with a response if, if one comes back to us. And again, I'd like to present these uh, excellent suggestions for presentation topics that we received from our audience. So if you're interested in one or all or any of these, please reach out to us and we'll help uh, guide you through a presentation as short as five minutes. And um, we do want everyone to be part of the MedSafety Exchange, and this is your MedSafety Exchange, it's our MedSafety Exchange, whether it's an incident analysis or initiative, please email us to share that. And as we approach the end of our third season, we always value your feedback, um, what are things you like, what are things you would like changed, please let us know and we'll continuously uh, try and improve how we deliver information and how you deliver information to everyone else. So uh, the link to the recording and the webinar will be available on the MedSafety Exchange website next week and the PDF of the slides is available upon request to the email address on the slide. And the registration for the next webinar in March 11th is now open, so you could head on over to the website and sign up. Thanks again to our speakers for important analyses and strategies and helping all our participants um, do better in medication safety. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and uh, we wish you all the best for 2020. So thank you. <laughs>